economy and textiles. My name is Christina. I'm from uh, Stockholm Environment uh, Institute Talent Center, or in short, ACI Talent. And uh, today's event is organized uh, together with Estonian Environmental Association and is sponsored by Estonian Investment Fund. I am very happy to say that we have today over 100 participants in eight different countries. And it shows that this topic is definitely very interesting to a lot of people. So uh, we have also a very interesting lineup of uh, different speakers from uh, several countries, from Estonia, also from Denmark and from Finland, who are going to give presentations today. Before I give you a short overview of today's speakers and of today's agenda, a few words about the house rules. I would kindly ask everyone to uh, keep your microphones on mute so we wouldn't disrupt the sounds of the presenters. Also, if you have questions to uh, some of the presenters, please write about them into the chat box. We will uh, keep an eye from uh, our team on the chat box and after the presentation we will come back to the questions you posted there. So the first part of today is going to be in uh, English language. It will be until around noon and after that we will have second part in Estonian language where some of the local initiatives uh, and organizations are going to give overview about what they're doing in the field of textiles. So a short overview about our agenda today. Sorry, sadly, it's, there are some technical issues. I'll have to go without the presentation, but we will start today with uh, the first presentation is going to be by uh, Reta Aus. She is a founder of Aus Design and an ethical designer. After that, we will have uh, Harry Mora, from, also from SEI Tallinn, who is going to be, give an overview about circular economy and textiles, about the European Union's uh, political context. After that, at 11, we will have uh, David Watson, senior expert from Plan Milieu. He will give an overview of the post-consumer textile flows in the Nordic and Baltic countries, uh, which is a project. Uh, financed by the Nordic Council of Ministers. At 11.30, we'll have a presentation about the uh, Telaketju 2 project in Finland, delivered by Pirjo Heikkila uh, from VTT, Technical Research Center in Finland. And the last presentation of the first part of the day is going to be at 11.50 by uh, Sini Ilmonen and she will give an overview about the public waste management as a platform for circularity of textiles. Then we will have a short break at 12.10 uh, for 20 minutes. And the second day, second part of the day is going to be in Estonian language where we have different uh, best practices from the textile value chain. We'll have uh, Stella Somnais, uh, Marie-Helene Gaber from Humana, Marie Martin from Fresh Lab, Kadiran Jagun from Lindström, and Tia Plamus from Taltech, who is going to be presenting their initiatives, organizations, uh, businesses, which will be followed then by a short discussion. And now I would like to give words to the first speaker of today, to Red Taus. Red, are you are you online? Yes, I am. Hello. <laughs> Thank Great. you. Thank you. Please. Oh. Yeah, good morning and um, uh, welcome to my home. <laughs> nice to talk with you from here. 
So, uh, yes, my name is Reta Aus. I'm a um, founder of House Design and Upmade and, uh, and uh, designer, fashion designer, and also a party working in Estonian Academy of Arts as senior researcher. So, a uh, very big part of my, um, my last 20, almost 20 years has been uh, research and uh, the topic, my research topic has been um, environmental issues in uh, fashion and textile industry. So I even wrote down a few facts for you where we could start, just to understand how big is the industry and, um, and then we can see what are the main problems in that. So the, in the textiles and clothing industry production, volumes have doubled over the past 15 years. It is a 1.3 trillion US dollars global industry and employing more than 300 million people. At the same time, in Europe, industry employs only 1.5 million people and represents more than 30% of the world market. Um, I think there are quite interesting numbers to just to understand uh, how big is the global industry and actually how small um, people are working uh, in it uh, from Europe. The current system, as, as, uh, as we know, is the linear take, make, dispose model. And it really has many, many environmental and social impacts. For instance, total greenhouse gas emissions from textiles production at 1.2 billion tons annually are more than Sorry, Reds, you are muted right now. Sorry, well, well, how that happened? No, it's working perfectly, thank you. Now it's good. How much did you...? A sentence, maybe. Ah, okay, then it's fine. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, textile and fashion is the second uh, biggest polluter in the, in the, in the, in the world, globally. So, and that really makes us uh, wonder, or for at least uh, I have had the question very long time, um, how this is possible, uh, why we are not doing better, uh, why the numbers are like this. So, for to just to understand why it's like this, first of all, we have to understand what's wrong in the industry. And um, to go through that, of course, it's uh, we have to understand that... Um, if we would like to change something, we have to understand what's wrong with it. And uh, for that, we would need uh, transparency in the industry, which is right now, we don't have. Uh, the global industry, as we all know, for example, if we take, for example, one cotton t-shirt, um, the life cycle of the product is very long. It's usually cotton is grown in one country, it's pinned in the other, fabric is made in the third, maybe the product is, uh, is put together in the, in the fourth country and then it's shipped all over the world. It's very um, complicated supply chain and, uh, and yes, I completely agree for the big companies, it's difficult to, to control, it's, typic it's difficult to keep it transparent. But um, we should do it, that should be the first step, I think we all agree in that. Because um, if we don't know how the cotton is grown, how can we change that? How, if we don't know how much waste uh, we have in the whole supply chain, how we can make the, the supply chain more resource efficient, etc. So the second uh, big issue, of course, is that uh, we are using uh, non-renewable materials in uh, in, the, in our products. So. Uh, they are not um, recycled, you can't recycle them later on. This is definitely one issue we should see as the oil industry is really the first one. Then we have air pollution and we have water pollution. We have a lot of chemicals used uh, used in the, in the process. And these chemicals, they don't only cause damage in the environment where they are used, but they are actually causing uh, problems for the consumers, for the people who are wearing these clothes. 
Um, a few years ago, we made um, a test in uh, in in a lab. Uh, it was uh, 2013, I guess. We were making one documentary, and we bought a pair of jeans just from the supermarket. It was Sara's jeans, and we took them to the lab um, in Finland, where uh, scientists were actually testing uh, what is the Mm, how the, the, the fabric would uh, influence the human body. And uh, we got uh, very interesting results saying that uh, these um, genes, they are actually highly toxic and uh, better not to use. And that, that was this kind of short fact, but shows us that actually we really don't uh, know so much, so much about the, the chemistry uh, in the textile industry, the impact of it. If uh, the impact for our body is... Um, is already very toxic, uh, then what happens in the places where uh, the toxicity level is much, much higher in the, in the factories where the chemicals are used. And a lot of uh, factories don't have water, like the cleaning systems uh, in place. So basically all these toxins, they just end up uh, in the rivers and through that in the, in the sea. And also the, the very big problem where we are talking more and more is the overconsumption uh, that uh, people are wearing clothes only maybe uh, average seven to ten times and then they throw it away. And of course that brings us to the next big issue and uh, this is the, the waste issue. Uh, textile waste, that has been really my research topic uh, long time. Mostly, of course, in the production, but if we see the problem here in Europe, uh, for example, the post-consumer waste has become very, very big problem. Why? Exactly because of the overconsumption. And the other reason why it's so big problem is that um, we are able to collect only 25% of used clothes. And from that 25%, we are able to actually circle or recycle 1%. And uh, this is extremely small number if you think about that. And we all know that EU is expecting uh, us to start collecting uh, uh, post-consumer or textile waste uh, uh, completely by 2025. And we have to find a solution for that. We have to circulate uh, all these leftovers back and uh, like now, just uh, for almost four years to go, and uh, and if you see the solutions, what we have out there, we understand that actually we don't have capacity to do that. Even if we are able to collect them all, then we really don't have very good solutions. So just very shortly about recycling, then we have like me mechanical recycling and chemical recycling. I'm not expert in, in this, this area, but uh, we have done some tests uh, with uh, mechanical recycling, uh, started already around four years ago. Um, because I have been working here in Estonia a lot with, uh, with our Uuskasutuskeskus, um, who collects uh, from the Estonian market and uh, tries to trying to find the solution what to do with that and they end up every every month a quite big amount of unsold clothes they have to find solution for and um, the one project what we did to, what we did together was um, um, taking the old change to the recycler and uh, buying back the yarn and uh, and making the new products out of it uh, it was very interesting because first of all it was very difficult to find some recycler who could, uh, who could be able to do 100% uh, post-consumer tenning. We found some. We, um, we have actually now tested different yarns. Um, actually, I have the product here just to show you. Uh, but we ended up uh, with quite nice products. Product itself is like this. If you see them, I will show it closer that when you see them, the yarn, you still can see the a little bit the tiny minutes, and uh, but of course in the first test the, the quality of the yarn was not very good. Uh, we struggled a lot uh, to make um, uh, 
good quality garment out of it. But in the end, uh, what was the lesson? The, the lesson was that uh, we really understood that uh, it's very expensive still. Uh, it's very complicated. And uh, what's the most complicated part in there? Uh, yes, we are able to collect quite nicely already in, in many countries. The system is there. In Estonia, we still don't have the, the, uh, the collecting system in place. We have different organizations who are doing that. But even if we collect everything, then we have to sort. Uh, the sorting is kind of complicated because uh, it's difficult to understand uh, what material it is. And you have to do it by hand. So. A um, few years ago, I visited uh, the biggest sorting center in Europe, it's uh, in Germany. And I was really surprised when I saw um, hundreds of uh, people really sorting our used clothes by hand. And the problem is that if somebody has cut out uh, the label where the numbers are in, then basically we don't know uh, what material it really is. But for the mechanical Recycling, we need uh, mm, monomaterials or like very, let's say, 97% cotton and then some, some ex extra. But if you see your clothes, for example, if you go to the wardrobe, you see that uh, most of the garments uh, are made from the mixed materials. And uh, that makes recycling really complicated. And even the next step, when we have uh, sorted all the fabrics and we now have the um, I don't know many tons of uh, of uh, tenim which is really uh, mm, good for the recycling we still there is still next step we have to clean it up we have to remove the patterns we have to remove zippers all all these kind of things what uh, has has been there what has to be there to use the product and finally when we get the raw material it, uh, all the process has been so long and so expensive that of course um, the yarn itself comes very, very expensive as well, and and as the fiber is is quite short, then the quality of the of the yarn is not so good that you you would uh, be hundred percent sure that you could get very good um, uh, product out of it. And that's the reason why recycling is always um, a lot mixed with uh, with uh, some kind of other raw materials. We have visited many factories in in India, for example, to see the recycling. Uh, which is really common in uh, in the big industry um, because uh, they are using uh, industrial leftovers, which is way easier in the two reasons. Because if the, for example, the cutting scraps coming from from the other factory, they know exactly what material it is. They take only uh, they take take in only mono materials, uh, and uh, it's it's basically pure waste. There is um, nothing, uh, no, no paper, no zippers, nothing in it. So it's very easy to recycle and then they they mix it um, uh, with uh, man-made fibers or some other other fibers uh, what are virgin. And uh, this practice of course is, is, um, is very um, very good and works really well in uh, industrial level. But when we are talking about post-consumer waste as I said, we're facing a lot of problems. Yes, they, if we would use only mono materials, it would be much easier, like uh, viscose, for example. Uh, it's uh, material what we can recycle like many, many times before it goes out from the, the lifespan, life cycle. And um, for the viscose, we're using uh, mm, wood, basically, or the 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 paper or even the old cotton scraps we could use for that. So it's um, it's very important uh, also for designers to understand that actually the materials we are using for our work uh, is very, very important because we are actually influencing the whole industry later on. So the, um, the other part of uh, waste is uh, pre-consumer waste or industrial waste. It uh, doesn't matter how we say, basically, we can say both ways. Um, that problem is, of course, much, much bigger in, uh, in, in countries where the production takes place. So it's a little bit, um, the problem is that way that in Europe and in the areas where we consume a lot, we have 
huge post-consumer waste problem and the areas where we produce our clothes there, uh, the biggest problem is the, the, the industrial leftovers or the, the fabric waste. When we are talking about the, the pre-consumer, then uh, the amount of that waste is huge. It's really, really big. For example, we have been working, our company has been working with uh, one very big uh, company in Bangladesh called Peximco. We started to run uh, our test projects uh, seven years ago. And uh, now we have our own certified line and we are producing only from their leftovers inside the factory. Uh, when we started the project, we, um, we carried out the proper waste uh, analysis and we understood that uh, more or less 20% everything was created there stays as a, as a waste. And for them, it is really a waste because they are the production company. They, uh, they are not the sales um, company. They are not looking for the, for the market to sell scraps or to sell roll lens or just, just to sell fabric. And uh, there are three main type of uh, leftovers in, in, in the industry or in the production. It's the, uh, the cutting, cutting leftover, which is like small pieces. The blouse, what I'm wearing, I'll let it show you, you could see from here, it's made from the small pieces. This is actually, mm, was the test uh, years ago to see how we could use uh, the cutting uh, leftovers, which uh, we had some measures. So from the measures, there was the biggest part was 30 centimeters or something like this. And then it was designed the way that we could basically place the pieces for that design into the into the original uh, design cutting. Uh, just very shortly how the process goes in the production is that if uh, the production starts, then they lay out the, the fabric, sometimes like they put uh, 50, 200, 100, it depends how big the order, uh, layers on the one table. The table is usually in the peak production 50 meters long. And then uh, on top they place uh, marker. Marker is it's called marker and there is the, um, uh, the pattern. And uh, always, of course, they try to do it as efficient as possible. But it really depends again uh, how, the, uh, how is the design. Some designs or some, and some patterns are very efficient, so the, the marker efficiency can go up to 93%. But uh, I have seen some uh, designs where the, if you place the pattern to the marker, the efficiency is uh, only like 45 to, to 50%, which means that already from the cutting off of the fabric goes to the waste. And this is again, um, I think, very good uh, point for the designers that we as a designers we should uh, really develop and create designs so with uh, with maximum efficiency when we start to do the pattern and uh, and cut the clothes out so but um, yes the, the most efficient way to reduce the waste uh, would be using uh, methods called upcycling and uh, that's exactly the first place where we could use it where the original product is placed already to the marker we could use all the all the space between the patterns and if we do it in the same time when the original um, product is cut out that would be really really efficient uh, the factory would do it in the same time the original product goes to the production one hand to the one side and the upcycled product the small pieces cut out from the same fabric can go to the to the upcycling line the second and the biggest part of the leftovers in the industry is uh, the roll lens. So you know, when uh, the layers are done and every roll, let's say if the sometimes comes in around 300 rolls for the one order and every roll after doing the, the layers, after every, every single um, roll lens, which is less than 50 meters is a leftover because they never do the overlapping because of the shade issues. And um, that's really the biggest part of the leftovers. Uh, and um, now, like last 
five years, mostly our brand has been producing our clothes from, uh, from the roll lens. It can start from the three meters and it can, can go up to like uh, 90, uh, well, like sorry, uh, 49 meters, for example. But you can't use these, um, uh, these pieces in the uh, mass production because um, cutting you have to do by hand. And that makes, of course, um, the production way more uh, like less uh, efficient. But for the up upcycling, what we do, we are using it as a leftover material to with the cutting by hand and our production is not so big for us. It's definitely a uh, very good material. And of course, for the big brands who should actually take care of their own, own leftovers, that would be the material uh, which is kind of, they have already paid for it, but it's there as a leftover. So basically, if they, if they do the calculation, uh, it balances out so the price for the production price uh, will be uh, exactly the same more or less so i show you one more product uh, what we have been uh, producing and what has been our um, kind of best seller this is the arrow shirt this is um, made from the uh, leftovers and always uh, in-house uh, that also makes upcycling much more valuable or the very efficient. Uh, you don't uh, and you don't transport the leftovers from one place to another, but you always go to the factory and produce inside the factory from their leftovers. Um, I think it's the. Um, I don't think actually we have done the study, and yes, this is the most efficient way to re reduce waste. Uh, uh, in in the in the production and um, and all the oh yeah then the the third type of leftovers what we have in production is overproduction and, uh, and that is definitely the most cynical type of uh, of waste because um, when uh, production starts then uh, factories always they produce three to five percent uh, more. Just to just to cover the gap, if there's some uh, not so good quality products, then they can replace it. And when I first time went to Peximco's uh, waste storage, and there was like like a mountain of uh, of bags uh, full of um, products. Then I climbed up and I took just first product uh, from the from the bag, and it was very good quality uh, Calvin Klein uh, men's shirt. Uh, here in the shop, I think it's around 200 uh, euros. But uh, in that place, in that day in Bangladesh, it was the waste. And, uh, and as Bangladesh doesn't have the proper waste management system, then all of this uh, overproduction causes a lot of problems for the factories because uh, they have nowhere to put it. So basically, if you travel around uh, the production areas uh, in Asia, uh, in India or in Bangladesh or in other places, you really see the problem out there very strongly. Uh, of course, some of the fabrics, some of the, the, the overproduced items, they are able to sell in the black market. Uh, they cut out the, the labels and uh, they try to sell it. A lot of these overproduced items actually come uh, here to Europe as well and we buy it from our second-hand shops but uh, more or less it's still if you see how big is the wastage and uh, how they how it mostly ends up just uh, in the nature and it's toxic waste it's just rotten there all the chemicals go to the ground groundwater and um, and people living in these areas uh, and they are drinking that water, which is highly toxic, of course. So it's a complex issue. And as I said, without transparency, it's very difficult to change something in there. So uh, now we have been talking a lot what's wrong in the industry. <laughs> it would be good, David, to think and brainstorm what we could uh, change, what we could do to change it and how then actually would be good 
way to produce our clothes. And I think the, the answer, we all know it's, it's a circular economy, it's circularity. Um, EU and the Green Deal what, uh, was published uh, last year and the action plan what came out now in, in the March uh, puts a lot of effort to the, and really stresses how strongly that circularity is something what we should implement to our production and to our uh, economic system. And I completely agree with it because we have all the knowledge how to do it. We have very practical uh, case studies. We have uh, understanding what should we change. And um, when we start from the beginning of the life cycle, and then of course we have to start producing and developing monomaterials, the materials we could uh, uh, keep in the loop years and years. Um, for example, as I mentioned, cellulose is one of them. Mm. But I think the main and the core issue is that uh, they really have to be monomaterials. And of course, um, we all know that cotton is not so good from the environmental point of view. We should definitely reduce producing cotton. Uh, how we make our clothes? Uh, I think the, as we all know, the the text like the uh, clothing production has been the same way uh, almost from the beginning. The sewing machine is still the same. It's the industry where um, we are doing it exactly the same way than a hundred years ago. I think it's it's one of the funniest thing in in that industry, and it's uh, it's, it's not going to change probably because everything what we can make more efficient. Uh, for example, talking about uh, placing the marker, uh, the pa pattern to the marker, we already have done. But still, that's the industry, but always needs a lot of manpower because of uh, because it's so uh, complex. So, and uh, then when we are talking about how much waste all this um, industry is producing, then definitely uh, the two key methods here are upcycling and recycling, what really helps us to circulate uh, uh, the leftovers back. Uh, upcycling is the most efficient way to do it because we don't have to invest new technology, we don't have, we don't need some different machinery, we just take the material as it is and we produce new products out of it. Uh, the only thing what we need is very good designer who would be able to really design from the leftover materials the new products, what we can actually sell and what uh, what would be successful. When we are talking about recy recycling, then recycling has to come in uh, when all the materials we are not able to upcycle should go into the into the recycling. And uh, yes, even I'm not expert uh, in that area, but still I can see that we really um, lack different. Uh, ways to do it. We lack actually successful companies doing it in the mass production level. And I think this is the big challenge, what uh, the industry is facing. But uh, first step still is transparency, that we really every company has, has to take responsibility of every step, um, starting from the raw material till the end, like what's the, what I will, what as a company I do with the product when the consumer actually bring it back to me. Every the circular, circularity really brings up the topic as well that how um, our big companies uh, will handle their own waste after the consumer has uh, brought that back. And that's going to happen. Definitely uh, companies have to take the responsibility. So our company has been testing with different ways to deal with the post-consumer waste as well. We had a very nice project uh, with ladies uh, weaving the carpets for us. There are millions and millions of uh, different possibilities, but still a lot of them are very studio-based and small and not in the big production. So just uh, to summarize, I would say um, we also should look into the educational system to see that are we able to to educate designers who know 
how to enter the, the, the circular business model and uh, how to uh, how to use it in the smart way. Um, the idea of circularity and uh, also we really need designers who who know all the process and who who have this life cycle thinking um, in their in back uh, back in their brain so strongly that they they always think back and forward not only how to make beautiful products but also how the products would be well done and recyclable later on so that's all i a little bit went over my time but i hope you got the message thank you thank you red it was a very interesting uh, presentation uh, as we can see that's textile industry when you talk about it it raises a lot of ethical environmental and also socio-economical issues which you addressed quite well and you gave a very good overview of the whole textile value chain i have uh, one question to you i would like to ask um so we have currently a crisis going on we cannot ignore it in today's mm -hmm. situation uh we see that the demand from different goods, also textiles, is decreasing. We see a different uh, uh, supply chains are disrupted. Uh, definitely countries, I can imagine, like Bangladesh might be affected by it because their economy is based basically on the textile industry. But what do you think? Can the current crisis, can we have some kind of positive outcomes for the textile industry out of current crisis? Of course. Uh, there is always something positive <laughs> in everything that happens, but this crisis is really um, um, challenging, I think, especially because uh, the global uh, supply chain is completely crashed right now. For example, uh, India closed all the factories uh, 25th of uh, March and Bangladesh followed two days later. And as we actually have the uh, the partners in the both countries, we are in the same situation that our production is uh, is uh, is not working, and I talk with the factories almost every day, and um, it's very interesting. For example, what's happening in Bangladesh right now, because um, uh, for them the biggest problem right now is actually hunger. That uh, because of uh, the crisis and uh, factories closed down, uh, they are not. They are not able to feed the, the poor people. So, um, and I, it seems that they will open the factories already, like quite soon. And then it will be kind of. Uh, uh, then we really don't know what will happen. And this is uh, is uh, it's a one point. It's understandable because uh, they they they're really facing uh, two problems and. One is not better than the other one. It's just really two very bad choices. But uh, because of the rioting and the situations, uh, they will probably open the factories quite soon. Uh, but then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the virus will take over anyway, and the, then it's completely difficult to, 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 to see what's, what's going to happen. The other hand, uh, I think it's the perfect time to, to come more local. We already found new partners in Estonia and, uh, and uh, in Poland, for example, and talking with some factories in, in, uh, in Latvia. Uh, years, years ago, before starting produ uh, producing in, in the big industry, uh, we had partners here in Estonia as well. But um, mm, life here is so much better, and our our waste management management system has been uh, so good that the, the need of upcycling in our smaller companies uh, was not it was not there yet. But now, because of the uh, uh, the 2025 and the, of course the price of the uh, the waste management has been growing as well. Uh, even smaller companies, they have to, um, they start to understand the need of the upcycling, the need of to, to really take care of the leftovers. And um, as an entrepreneur, I can see uh, the crisis is really, really good for um, for the smaller brands in the way that uh, to bring the 
the, the production back more local. Uh, that actually gives the possibility to, to really make all the process much more transparent that, um, because everything is uh, so close when we talk about Estonia. Estonia is such a small country, very flexible. It's, uh, it's very, very easy to implement the circularity in here, like, for example, industrial symbiosis. Uh, everybody knows everybody. Uh, like some, something, like some waste from one place is this, like good raw material for the other. I think um, this crisis really, if we use it well, if we know um, what to do, it would be extremely good moment um, to start this like local um, circular model here inside the Europe to bring as much as possible back. And that would also give us a little bit more um, security. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, for, for your answer. Uh, we will now move on for our uh, next presenter. Harry, are you uh, with us? Yes, good morning also from my side. I try to share my slides. I hope you, you see them. Uh, yes, I was also thinking about the impact of the crisis and uh, since I have to give a very short presentation this time, right? Yes, you have uh, some, some I don't minutes. have too much time, but uh, since you have heard me so many times, I, I try to be very short, but I can't really resist in saying a few words about this nice coronavirus crisis that we have. In a way, it's interesting. We have a uh, I started to think about that and then in in a way by from the consumption point of view and if I start to think uh, started to think how much or what I have bought during uh, last month and it's only a food stuff so in a way this corona crisis has shifted us to the in a way dream future which we actually many of us wanted to see from the sustainability point of view the only problem is that I I'm afraid when this virus or the crisis is over, quite many of us will quickly go out to, to satisfy their, their, in a way, their, their dreams. And, um, you know, we all, in a way, from the psychological point of view, would like to fulfill our needs. So, but ho I, I really hope that we can do that in a much more um, sustainable way. And today, as I understand, in the second part of the uh, event, we can uh, hear some of the very nice examples, which in a way allow us to consume much more sustainable way. But as we heard from Reet, actually the sustainable or let's say circular textile system is very complicated because it's it's a global, it's it involves many uh, stakeholders, many actors. So. The question on how to reach to this circular, or, or sometimes we can also say flow textiles economy, it's really a, a challenge in a way because we have so many aspects uh, to tackle, so many problems and caps. Red very nicely uh, gave us an overview. What are those those main problems in this uh, system, so to say? So starting from design so we definitely need to redesign the products so to make them more circular at the end of the life cycle so the problem related to collected waste streams materials as such so they had already mentioned that of course uh, it would be preferable to have shorter supply chains but uh, we we have to take into account that the textile industry is really a global industry so we produce the textiles and garments in one part of the world and we consume them widely in the other part of the world so how to really uh, bring those flows back to those places where we can really consume them in terms of producing new products so the, the, the technology so it's a real challenge so how to really develop those uh, technologies to really allow to go for more recycling there is a need to really support that area. It's not very uh, uh, economically feasible, as we heard also. Business models. So we definitely need to, to, to think on how to make this um, 
the, those cycles more longer. This is also important. Often the circularity has been understood that this is uh, very much related to recycling. So making or closing the circle, but it's not so. So if we really would like to have a sustainable a circular textile economy, then we really have to make those circles much slower. So we need to have a new business models. And last but not least, of course, we have to create a demand. And this is, I would say, the biggest problem in this complex system. So, of course, we all have, a, a, in a way, a role to play here, especially when it comes to the industry and consumers. But it's quite clear that we also need effective policies to drive the circular textiles economy. We need uh, to change the, the system and uh, we have to really come over with the current linear or let's say market uh, economy based system, which really doesn't allow us to go for more circular uh, economy in, in the textile sector and also other sectors. So we need those supportive effect, effective policies and we have to really focus on those policies on every life cycle of textiles, starting from materials and design, but also production and distribution, collection, waste management, use, reuse, recycling and so on. But often, of course, we have understood that this is very much related to, let's say, waste related policies. And that's true when it comes to current policies and legal requirements. We often uh, talk about waste management. But if we want to go for, for more global or really a system-wise different uh, circular textile system, then we have to really integrate the circularity aspects to different policies, not only materials, chemicals and products and waste, but also public procurement, trade policies, innovation policies, industry policies. So this means that we are not talking here about environmental problem and often we are also here in Estonia tend to talk about circular economy as a as a part of environmental policy and often this is has been seen as as the responsibility of uh, Ministry of Environment. So I think this is one of the biggest uh, in a way uh, challenges. Uh, we have to see this issue not in different levels, also on policy level as, as, a, as an integrated overreaching issue. And here I hope that also during our seminar we have here participants from other ministries and other policy areas who really take into account that and then integrate in this issue into different, uh, different areas. So, of course, European, uh, European Union has put lots of attention on, on textiles in its uh, circular economy agenda and um, it's it's obvious in a way because as we heard uh, textiles and fashion industry is one of the biggest polluter it's very resource in intensive uh, industry and that's why it has to play a significant role in this uh, circular economy policy context Recently, the European Commission has uh, adopted um, a new circular economy action plan, which is one of the main blocks of this uh, overreaching European Green Deal, which is, I would say, the main and the only agenda for sustainable growth for the European Union. And according to this plan, um, uh, the Commission will then propose soon a comprehensive European Union strategy for textiles, as it uh, has been already done in the case of plastics. So we can expect quite uh, many uh, uh, regulatory and non-regulatory uh, instruments to become uh, uh, in life in, in close future, which will tackle all those issues which we already have today introduced briefly. So basically, we need a sustainable product framework for textiles, starting from uh, really uh, developing a new and uh, circular uh, textile products. We have to face out hazardous chemicals, which was also interesting, uh, which is, has not been too much uh, emphasized before, because often when we are talking about circularity, we tend to forget that uh, chemicals and especially hazardous chemicals this is definitely a part of circularity question. So we really have to face out how the hazardous chemicals which are related to the textile industry. So again, developing a business and regulatory environment which really uh, support the uh, 
the the environment or ecosystem for new uh, business models starting from product to service models circular materials upcycling recycling all those uh, uh, new developments which uh, which where there are quite many nice examples but uh, due, which due to certain uh, uh, obstacles, especially uh, economic uh, barriers, are not so successful yet. Uh, Red also mentioned this um, this kind of uh, challenge which we all, as member states, face, which comes through the uh, waste legislation as part of the circular economy package. We uh, most of us we know that uh, member states they have to start to collect the uh, textile uh, used textiles and it's not only used textiles in terms of uh, uh, the textiles that we can still reuse but also textile waste by 2025 and we can also expect that the uh, European Commission will come up with uh, with uh, targets for recycling and most probably also for reuse uh, before that uh, deadline. So we need a, a really a boost and uh, a very quick development of, of all those uh, uh, technological and um, also business related uh, developments starting from sorting, reuse, um, also um, repair, all these business uh, approaches which have been actually early, earlier or years ago been very common uh, but which are dying out slowly so we have to come back to that uh, for sure plus of course new innovative approaches which can be done based on totally new technologies first of all IT uh, solutions and then of course at the end of the day we should always question who will pay for it and uh, we see here clearly that the European Commission is very seriously thinking of introducing extended producer responsibility principle also in textiles area. We all know about the packaging or waste electronics or tires collection system, which is based on uh, extended producer responsibility, but how to introduce it into textiles and garments. This is really a question, especially when it comes to, let's say, Estonia or the Baltic states where we have actually quite bad experience in really introducing or implementing the transparent, transparent extended producer uh, responsibility system. So, so we have many, many issues to think over. So from one side, if we now come to the European, let's say the member state level, then of course sorry, European sorry. policy. Okay. Yes. I'll give you one minute. one minute. Yes. So this is almost the last slide. So I can say that the European policy is, of course, the basis for all of us as member states to develop our own uh, policy goals and targets and also defining and implementing certain policy measures. And it's very important that we will take into account the local context and we need uh, a proper information for that. So we need to do a proper review and analysis of the current system. So after me, David will pre present you a nice overview of, uh, of waste uh, situation and also textiles, uh, circular uh, system uh, at today in three Baltic states. So this type of knowledge is very, very important to, to really introduce the policy measures. And what I also can say, and I'm not going to go into details here, in the, in the frame of the uh, Nordic Ministry of Council Finance project towards to a uh, Nordic Baltic Circle textile system, we will uh, soon uh, present a, a report which will then cover nicely the, our recommendations, which we have developed together with quite many of you, uh, industry and other stakeholders. So I hope that uh, this, this report will be available for all of you and you can then read it and really I hope that the policymakers soon will start to develop these policy measures because as we have understood there is no time to wait it's time to act so this is shortly all from that side so as I said uh, we will keep you posted concerning the potential uh, policy recommendations so keep updated and uh, you get the information from uh, SCI website as well as the website of uh, Estonia Association for Environmental Management. Thank you very much. Hansi. 
And now let's move on to David Watson from Plan Milieu. Right. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can no, hear you. Good. <laughs> so I will share my slides if I can. Just a second. Uh, this one. Are you getting that? Yes, we have it. Good. Okay. So um, nice to 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 see you all out there. Um, it's very odd to be talking to over a hundred people. Um, over my computer and not being able to hear anyone or see anyone, but at least I can see your names and, and you can't normally do that in a, in, a, in a conference. So maybe this is the future of conferences. It's definitely more, more sustainable to do it this way. Um, so I'm gonna talk uh, uh, quite briefly about a project which um, we've been carrying out for the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, led by SEI uh, and including these four, uh, uh, different consultants at the bottom here, plus uh, another consultant in Latvia. Um, hello? Someone's not... Uh, Harry, you need to mute. Harry, mute your... Uh, okay, someone's coming through, you're not muted. Yeah, sorry. So I'll carry on. Um, this is a project that began in 2018. Uh, towards the end of 2018, and the, the well, I'll talk about the goals in a second. The background to the project, just go forward, um, is as you already heard, there's an increasing focus on sustainability in the textile value chain in Europe. Um, this has been now a focus area in some countries for about five to eight years, uh, in other countries, it's just beginning. Um, Reet already told you about the environmental impacts of, uh, of the textile um, consumption and production. If you look at, 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 uh, at, at uh, product groups, then it's uh, the fourth largest product group in terms of environmental impacts in, of all the different product groups that we, we consume in Europe. And one way, not the only way, but one way of reducing the impacts of the consumption and production of textiles is through this so-called increasing of circularity. It's not the only way. Cleaner production is another example. Um, simply reducing our consumption is, is a real clear way of, of, uh, of achieving this. But when we talk about circularity, and, and Harry's already made this point, um, we don't mean recycling. Recycling is one, is like the outer, I don't know if you all know the, the Ellen MacArthur, famous butterfly, um, but the recycling is basically the very last circle. So. What we want to do is change from the top um, picture where someone has a pair of jeans, uh, quite fat jeans, those ones, um, and then they use them for, for a, a few uh, weeks. And then they have them in their closet unused for a long time. And then but while it's still got functional lifetime, they basically throw it out and uh, it gets incinerated or landfilled. Um, so what we want to get to is, is uh, another picture where the functional lifetime of, uh, of a product is actually much extended, much longer, so they're much more durable products. Um, they, they're used for their full functional lifetime, not just by one user, maybe by several users, and this is again through several different kinds of business models that enable sharing. Um, this could be used in different countries, it doesn't have to be in the same country, it could be across the globe. And then when they finally can't be repaired or can't be used any longer, then they can be recycled um, perhaps upcycling. Uh, Reek was very. This, I, I very much liked her, her presentation of the upcycling, which is 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 uh, environmentally better than mechanical chemical recycling. But anyway, fed into new textile products. Um, so this is the kind of the circularity we're trying to get to. Um, and as you already heard, the EU have got the circular economy package. Um, which talks about very much these issues. Uh, eco design uh, is needed, separate collection is needed uh, of, of textiles, and also, um, yeah, eco design to ensure that everything can be reused as far as possible and then re re recycled when it, when it no longer can be reused. Um, the Baltic states already, this project was the, for the Baltic states, all three. Um, and they already play quite a key role in circularity of the Nordic textiles, which is why the Nordic Council of Ministers was involved in it or, or, or wanted to, to initiate this project. 
because actually a lot of the the used textiles in in the Nordic countries end up being sent to the Baltic states for um, for sorting, detailed sorting, and uh, and some reuse, but also some export, re-export for reuse and, and recycling elsewhere. So, does this have an impact on the Baltic countries' own um, circularity of their post-consumer textiles? That was one of the key questions of this of this project. Um, and just to pick up on something that Reed said about the about the sorting. Um, Sorting has to be manual. And the reason for that is uh, you're sorting primarily for reuse. There's no money in recycling, the money's in the reuse. And so you can't, and you can't sort by a machine for, re for reuse, only for recycling. But the, once you've done the, re the, 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 the sorting for the reuse, then there's, become, there's kind of technologies now that are very close to industry level where you can do automatic uh, uh, sorting by material type. But uh, we'll come to that. So the goal of the mapping, this was to provide a detailed picture of uh, the flows of textiles, new and used textiles in the Baltic states, um, which could be used as a basis for then developing policy. Um, and then identifying challenges and opportunities for the region and potential uh, policy initiatives that can be developed to take advantage of these. So that was the basic, uh, the goals of this project, which is now coming to an end. Uh, uh report is almost finalized and should be out there end of june so i won't dwell on this slide but this is basically what we wanted to find out and the method for getting there so we made a lot of use of um of existing data in terms of import export data trade data and production data domestic production data in the three countries um we carried out surveys of, of uh, the current collectors of used textiles, inc including charities, commercial collectors, municipal waste companies, and so on. Um, we also carried out, because we wanted to find out what was happening in, the, in the, um, the wholesale sector. So as I said, the Baltic countries are big importers of used textiles from other parts of the world. So we also interviewed um, uh, companies working in this area. The, the, the wholesalers, um, and we also looked at trade data on used textiles. So these were the kind of main sources of our, of our data. Um, consumption of textiles, this is the first area, consumption of new and used textiles in the three countries. This is the consumption in terms of euros, uh, euros per capita. Um, this is readily available from, from Eurostat. As you can see on the left, we've got the EU average. Um, the Baltic countries consumption is a little less than, well, Estonia is a little less than the EU average. Latvia is significantly less, about half. Uh, Lithuania is somewhere in between. The blue is the clothing, expenditure on clothing. And this is household expenditure. And the red is household textiles. So this is, um, uh, this is bed clothes and, and towels and bed, yeah, and, and uh, tables, tablecloths and so on. Um, so expenditure on that is quite a lot lower than on clothing. If you look at the consumption by volume, so by, by in kilograms per capita, you can see here that um, Estonia is again quite a lot higher than the other two countries, actually more than twice the consumption in Latvia. This consumption data is for 2018. Um, and actually, consumption of, of home textiles, household textiles, so the, the bed linen and so on, is, is extremely high in Estonia compared to what we normally expect. We've, we've, we looked at 2017 data as well, and that showed exactly the same results. So we're not totally sure whether this is realistic or whether there is some consistent mistake in the data, but, but the, the same result was found for, for more than one year. So we don't know quite the cause of this. Um, uh, so consumption in Estonia is relatively high, 12 kilograms per capita, Latvia six kilograms per capita, but in it, consumption in Latvia and Lithuania is, it, is growing extremely rapidly. So just between 2017 and 2018, it was increasing by 37% uh in in 
in Lithuania, 25% in Latvia, only 9% in Estonia, but still, that's still quite a fair uh, growth. I'm assuming that now with Corona, um, maybe we'll see a reduction in uh, in 2020, but let's let's find out in a, in a year or two. Um, yeah, now this is, that was new clothing. Now we have the consumption of used clothing added on to that. So as you see, the consumption of used clothing and, and used to, and, and textiles is actually quite significant. Um, it's around 2.4 to 2.7 kilograms per person in the Baltic states. Uh, and, and this makes up almost a third of consumption in Latvia and Lithuania, a sixth of consumption in Estonia. This is very high. Um, most of this consumption, most of these used textiles that are being consumed are not the textiles that are being collected from households in the same countries, but they're the ones that are being imported from, from elsewhere. Uh, in Estonia, that's not totally the case. It's about a fifth of the, new, of the secondhand consumption is, is being recirculated within the country. In the other two countries, it's almost entirely from, from uh, imports. Um, so if we compare this consumption rates to some other, so these are some countries we've recently done mapping for in the, in the Nordics. Consumption rates are lower in, uh, in the Baltics, but in Estonia, not that much lower. Um, but significantly, the, the consumption of used textiles is much higher. Um, Denmark is, is apparently the highest consumption of used textiles in the Nordics, um, but still that only represents around 10% uh, of total. In Norway, it's, it's less than 1%. So this is something, some, some differences to bring out between the Nordics and the Baltics. Now we move on to collection of used textiles uh, in the three countries. So who's carrying this out? It's uh, quite different between the three countries. Um, in Estonia, it's dominated by the charities and some uh, municipal waste, waste companies that are doing the collection, with the commercial collectors actually quite coming on the scene only relatively recently and only having 17% of collection. Um, in, in Latvia, the charities are also is a, a quite dominant, two thirds of collection. Uh, whilst in Lithuania, it's the commercial collectors that are that are that are more dominant. But but important to see that the municipal waste companies in both Estonia and Lithuania have quite a high share of of the collection. And this is this is collection they're carrying out themselves. This isn't collection that uh, of, that charities or commercial um, uh, companies are carrying out in civic community sites like recycling centres, but actually what they're doing themselves. So it's interesting to see what. It differences in what happens to the treatment of this. Um, yeah, so collection is mostly happening via bring banks, and these are on the street or in civic community centers, as I said, or sometimes indoor collection in shops, uh, or, uh, and very much um, donations over the counter in secondhand shops and charity shops, and so on. Um, there's no door to door collection in in uh, the Baltic states. Um, maybe that'll come after 2025 or towards 2025, we'll see. Separate collection from households uh, in terms of volume. Estonia is, is represents two thirds of all the collection um, carried carry out in the Baltic states in tons. Um, you, you saw the split between the charities and municipal waste companies before, but there's about nearly 5,000 tons of, of uh, used textiles collected from households every year. In, in uh, Estonia, only around five 600 tons in, in Latvia, uh, 2,000 tons in, in Lithuania. Because the Estonian collection is so high, this also represents a much higher share of textiles, new textiles and uh, placed on the market. So, these percentages here in the bold, uh, this gives the percentage of, of the new textiles placed in the market, which are collected separately, like not necessarily the same year, but at some point. So 30% of, of, uh, of textiles that are consumed by or purchased by households in Estonia, at some point end up being um, delivered uh, somewhere separately for reuse and recycling. 
Um, if you look at the, the consumption of new and used together, and that's about 25%, much lower in Latvia um, and, and lower in Lithuania as well. So Estonia is actually doing quite well in terms of collection. Um, if we compare it to uh, other parts of Europe, these are the countries with, with available data right now. Um, so you see the green is the consumption in kilograms per capita of new textiles, and then the purple is the collection of used textiles. And then the percentages is, is the percentage that the collection of used represents of textiles placed in the market. So as you can see, my old country, I no longer live there, I live in Denmark, uh, is a ridiculously huge consumer of, uh, of, of textiles, more than around 27 kilograms per capita. I have no idea why, I think it's mostly really bad quality budget uh, textiles. Um, huge quantities there. Estonia is lower than the, than, than the Baltic countries, but not that much lower. Um, Lithuania, Latvia, quite a bit lower uh, than all the other countries in, with, with data. Um, and the collection rates in Estonia are similar to Sweden, more than Finland, but that was quite old data, so we don't know what the, what the newer data is. Um, so Estonia is not doing so bad, but, but things can definitely be improved. Um, what happens to the textiles after they're separately collected? Uh, we've heard a little bit already from Reet on this. Um, if we look at the, all the Baltic countries as a whole, what the fate is of these textiles. So they're, they're basically, uh, uh, some of them, are, um, are, if there's collection over the counter, then there doesn't necessarily need to be any sorting of that. They can be directly uh, donated, but a lot of them are sorted before anything happens. Um, and then these are sorted into different fractions, which are then decided what happens to them afterwards. Reuse in, within the country represents 13%, or it did in 2018, uh, of, of the total collection. So this is kind of the top quality. This is the best quality that, that can be reused uh, locally. Um, then there's a little bit, very little amount of, of recycling within the country, and this is almost entirely Lithuania, but this is happening. There's almost no recycling whatsoever within Estonia and, uh, and, and Latvia. Quite a large amount is, is exported for reuse and recycling elsewhere once it's been collected. Um, and that's also true of what's being sold donated to the wholesalers, this 15% down there on the, on the left. This is, sorry, this is what's happening for, the, for all collectors. So I'm going to show you what's happening to the individual types of collectors uh, in a minute. You can, uh, for all collectors, no less than 42% after collection is actually then being wasted. So it's been collected separately, but it's seen as having no value in some way. So 42% is then being landfilled or incinerated. This is, is quite high. If you look at the, on the right hand side, the charitable commercial collectors, this amount is actually only 15%. So they're making use of 85% of, of what they're collecting. Um, so 15% so they can't use for anything. Um, if you look at the other types of collectors, this is hugely different. There's, there's one main brand collecting, uh, I think you all know who it is, um, collecting in the Baltic states. All of this is exported for reuse, recycling elsewhere. So it's been exported for, for sorting in, in Germany. And then some is re mostly reused, and then there's some recycling and, and some waste. Um, the right hand side here, this is the bit of the shocker. Um, this is what's happening to the textiles that are collected by the waste companies. So 97% is being landfill or incinerated. Why is that? In Estonia, there's at least the excuse that. In some civic community centers, um, or quite a lot, there's some charities that are set up a uh, uh, separate collection there of the, of, the, of the reusable. So anything that comes into the, to the municipal waste company's own containers is basically the non-reusable, supposedly. There is probably some reusable there. And right now, since there are no recycling um, uh, uh, possibilities for in Estonia, or very few, um, the waste companies don't have any uh, anywhere to send this, and they've been looking at opportunities, but but often, uh, in some cases, they've basically been collecting it because they have to. So in, in Estonia, 
waste companies are supposed to, I just show you the Estonian figures here. That was for all the Baltics before, but these are in Estonia. So basically all the textiles collected by the waste companies are landfilled or incinerated. Um, and, and they have to, legally, they have to set up separate collection of textiles, but basically once they collect it, they just burn it or they, they landfill it. Hopefully this is gonna be changed in the near future. They're looking for a possible remarkets now, and this is a bit of a chicken and egg. So what they're saying is we can't find markets until we know what we've got. So we're doing, they're, they're doing sorting now to find out what it is they have, and then they can start finding markets. But we hope to see that this, this will change very much in the future. Um, yeah, so this is uh, uh, perhaps surprising for some. Um, move on. So now to the wholesale sector. So that was before what's happening domestically to the domestically collected textiles. Now, if we look at the wholesale sector, so the importers, they, uh, the Baltics are importing a lot of used textiles, particularly Lithuania. So Lithuania um, importing more than 60,000 tons a year. Um, Estonia, 10,000 tons a year. If you compare this to the domestic collected used textiles, it's, it dominates, particularly in Latvia and Lithuania. So the used textile market is very much about imported textiles, less so in Estonia, where the domestic collected represents about a third of total used textiles that are, that are coming in or, or exist in the, in the country. If you look at this in terms of kilograms per capita, um, the Baltic states represent three of the top four importers of used textiles in, in Europe. Lithuania is, uh, is, is, the, is the largest, then Netherlands, and after that it's it, Latvia and, and, and uh, Estonia. So 23 kilograms per capita in Lithuania, um, eight kilograms per capita in Estonia that's being imported. Um, this is a little less than, than consumption of new textiles, but not that much less, and much more in Lithuania than consumption of new textiles. What happens to the imported textiles? Well, they're, as I say, they're, they're imported they're to, to, to big facilities, um, varying size facilities, but some of them very large, um, where they're sorted manually. Um, and, and, the, and the basic reason for doing the, the sorting, the basic reason for the importing is for the reuse markets. That's where the money is, it's in the reuse. So the, the importers don't really want uh, any waste, but they get some anyway, because what they're importing for the most part is, is so-called original, which means um, what's been delivered directly to the bring banks in other countries. Um, and then it's sent out to the sorting, um, the sorting facilities untouched. Uh, and then they're sorting it manually. And then some of it is being, uh, so they're sorting it into several hundred different kinds of fractions, different um, types of clothing, different sizes, different uh, styles, and so on. Quite a lot of this is actually being reused locally. So particularly in Estonia, 26% of what's being imported is actually, is actually then sold for reuse on local domestic markets. Less so in Lithuania, more in, in Latvia. Some is being um, re exported for reuse in other parts of the world. So uh, altogether, actually 53% of what's being imported to Estonia is then reused somewhere. Uh, and another 39% is being recycled. Um, in the case of Estonia, all of this is being recycled elsewhere. So there's no recycling of, of textile waste in, in Estonia. Um, yeah, so moving on to the key messages. What how am I doing for time? Oh, yeah, so just got a few mess quick messages here. Uh, most of them I've already said. So consumption patterns are relatively sustainable at the moment uh, is relatively low, or I wouldn't say sustainable, but they're more sustainable than other countries um, because the, the consumption is relatively low of new clothing, but it's increasing rapidly. So this is something to look at uh, and needs to be addressed. Um, clothing tends to be used more intensively before and being discarded, which is, was, uh, which is one reason why um, the reuse rates of domestically collected textiles are lower than in other countries because Basically, they've been used until they're in a in a in they've been used much more intensively, so they're not uh, readily reusable to a large extent. Um, this is a good thing, um, not necessarily good for the collectors, but it's good 
for the secular economy, that people are using them until they're falling to pieces much more often than, than say, in the Nordic countries. So the, these, the, the Baltics aren't throwaway societies, but maybe they're getting there. Um, consumption of secondhand is high, as I already said, a third of total consumption in Latvia, Lithuania, a sixth in Estonia. But domestic collection and treatment of used textiles is struggling. Collection rates are relatively low, particularly in Latvia, Lithuania. Um, majority of textiles is still ending mixed waste, and this is mostly being landfilled. So it's being wasted. The quality and value of collected textiles is low and is falling. This may be partly fast fashion, uh, but it can also be because people are using it more intensively. Um, there's relatively low reuse rates of collected textiles, domestically collected textiles, only around 40 to 55, 45%, which is lower than, say, in Denmark, where it's around 65 to 70% of, uh, of domestically collected textiles, which are eventually reused. Um, and and the, the domestic collection can't compete in quality with what's being imported. So that's really important. So what the charities and commercial uh, companies are collecting in in the Baltics can't compete with, which, with the quality of what's being which in, imported from overseas. And this is both for the reusable, but also the recyclable in both cases. There are very few local recycling options, especially Latvia and Estonia. Um, and so a very high share is being disposed of to land for an incineration of what's being separately collected. And this is particularly true of what's being collected by the waste companies. Um, I'd skip the next one over because that's only true for Latvia and Lithuania. There is cooperation between charities and commercial uh, collectors and the waste companies in Estonia, which is a good thing. Um, but the economic viability of collectors is really challenged. And this is particularly true in rural areas. And as we move towards 2025, when we're going to be collecting much more volumes of textiles, there's going to be much more volume of of low quality textiles. And this is going to be really undermine the economic viability of the collectors, which is already um, really marginal. So they're very worried about the future. Um, the wholesale sector offers some challenges, but also opportunities. Yes, yeah, I said, three of the four largest imports per capita of used textiles in the EU are the Baltic countries. The Baltics are providing circular economy services to the Nordics and elsewhere in Europe by by importing and and uh, and and sorting and and finding markets for these uh, used textiles, and it's generating at the same time somewhere between two thousand four thousand jobs in the region, and eighteen percent of these imported textiles are resold with secondhand within the Baltics. But seventeen thousand tons of textile waste is generated from the from the wholesale sector um, for recycling. 12,000 tons of these are exported recycling elsewhere. Couldn't we somehow, isn't there like um, a, a, an opportunity here for more recycling within the Baltics? There's, there's thousands of tons available there just waiting for, for someone to, to develop new technologies, to, to locate in the Baltics and generate the huge uh, new business models that, 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 could, uh, that could arise. Um, and that could also concern the 7,000 tons of textiles waste that are just being landfill or incinerated. Um, so I see there being a lot of opportunities here because of this, this, uh, this proximity of the, of, the, of the wholesale sector this, this, uh, in the Baltic countries, which, which will allow, it, which provides good opportunities for, for, um, for recycling uh, um, technologies to, to be located in the Baltics, which will then assist the local collectors so but but these all need support um we need also we need uh, i feel there's an opportunity for large-scale upcycling redesign as reed was also talking about um because of the the supply of, of used fabrics good quality fabrics low labor costs and skilled workers um perhaps for sale back to nordic markets so i think that this could be a real opportunity um and another opportunity is that the circular consumption culture already exists in the Baltics. It's existed for, for many, many decades, um, and, but it needs to be supported to continue. All these opportunities need policy and money to start up and support. So we need to find out how to do this. Thanks a lot for listening. I've just gone over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, we will not take questions at this moment because we are running a little bit behind of the time.
So I would sure. get uh, to our next presentation by Pirjo Heikkilä about uh, Telaket U2. Can you see my uh, image now? Yes, we can see your image. Yeah, I just uh, shortly show myself <laughs> and then I will start sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see that now? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Pirja Heikkilä and, and, and I'm very uh, thankful to ask for presenting our activities in Finland. So uh, I'm been coordinating Telakatu activities, its network and its uh, research activity. And uh, I tell you about that and how we have been able to, to make a change towards circularity of textiles in Finland. Our VTT Technical Research Center of Finland is uh, kind of creating sustainable growth by tackling global challenges, uh, textiles, and, and turning them in the in the circular are really one of those those global challenges and need for system, sustainable development. VTT is a huge uh, multidisciplinary technology organization, over 2,000 employees, and but maybe we don't go into details now. We work with the companies directly with the partnerships. We do joint projects and work through innovation ecosystems. And our spot in the, in the research scheme in Finland is that we are doing applied research while universities are more focused on basics and then uh, industry in, in their development work. So we, we are doing cooperation with all of them and, and, and focusing on applied work. These are our kind of main focus areas, climate action, resource sufficiency, industrial renewal, all closely related to textile circular economy. But as we have already heard today, uh, chemical issues, environmental issues, social issues related to textile uh, production at the moment, it's all also kind of safety and, and good life issue. So what VTT has been doing earlier before this, this Telaketju, we started and I have been involved in, in this kind of circular economy and recycling projects since 2015 and we started with the relooping fashion initiative where we made this kind of model how what how a circular business ecosystem for textiles should look like this is there are similar images um, drawn by other other organizations as well but we put the users on top and have the inner circles going around them so uh, reuse showing here in, in green and then uh, kind of uh, recycling cycles in blue. And during that, that project, we kind of started making, thinking what should be. One part of that project was making this kind of pilot, how to recycle old cotton clothes in the new, uh, new fabrics. But when we were kind of end, ending of this project and there was other activities going on in Finland, especially in Turku area, Textile 2.0 together, with the, our project group and, and the other project group, we started to think that we have to start building this kind of ecosystem. And that was kind of initiation of Telaketju work. Uh, we start making application 2016, and, and this is the first phase of, of, of research started 2017. This was the image which we used for kind of uh, communicating about our plans for companies and other organizations involved in textile recycling. So focus were in the first stage more on, on recycling part. We wanted to understand the supply of, of materials, how to collect them, how to sort, how to refine and make final products out of, out of these materials. But we can shortly notice that there are so many different kind of organizations involved and the funding tools for research are very focused on certain type of organizations or work. But there was a kind of good uh, opportunity for us that Ministry of Environment 
so YM mentioned here, is uh, was ha having this kind of call for uh, experimental uh, circular economy experimentations, and and Tekes currently known as Business Finland has a kind of continue continue opportunity for uh, research organizations apply funding together with companies. So we were able to kind of include municipal waste management organizations. Lona Sominiate Huoltosini will be talking about uh, right after me about the activities, but they were coordinating the other part and, and were able to include recycling uh, centers, public uh, participant charities and so on, while Tekes or Business Finland part was kind of uh, funding uh, companies and and research organizations. And, and Telaketu is not just kind of single project or, or, or research activity, it's also active network composing of all organizations who are involved directly in these activities or doing cooperation with us. These are participants of Telaketu YM and Tekes projects. And like I said, that we also had we, we did a lot of cooperation with other other Finnish organizations involved in in these textile cycles in there. But focus were collecting, sorting, and recycled chain of textiles, and and we have written English language report about the Tekes project, including also kind of main points from from YM project as well. Just to show some kind of examples what we did. There was, for example, collection trials with two box systems, reusable and textile waste collected in the same place, directly from consumers. We studied identification and sorting, so manual sorting, as well as, as kind of automated uh, uh, sorting and, and how technology can be used for, for identification of textiles. We had some kind of theoretical work as well, for example, what kind of, what is the uh, property and sorting requirements for textile materials for different kind of recycling processes. So there are also more theoretical work, but my favorite, especially where those demonstrations, so practically so, how different kind of textile fraction, fractions can be recycled and these demonstrations were done by companies and by uh, research organizations and in many cases also in cooperation so so multiple organizations were included on the same same demonstration or, or it was kind of chain of, of demonstrations and, and here are some examples, for example, how to how we made yarns from kind of mixed ways. Infinite Fiber Company recycled cotton into new regenerated cellulose fibers. We have these towels made from jeans, also workloading by touch point. Uh, composite side uh, pillow. Pillows can be kind of all in. Uh, recycled into composite materials, so polyester filler and, and cotton topping together make a composite. Then non-woven materials, acoustic panels and furniture, so different kind of materials uh, tested and, and, and demonstrated during our first phase. But then that came into end um, more than one year ago, and then we started to think what to do next. Lona Sominiate Huolta had ongoing activities about refinement plant, and you will hear about those from Sini. But the, while that was going on, we started kind of public research uh, by Business Finland funding to go alongside with that. And in this uh, second phase, we, we started to have a kind of build business from the circular economy of textiles. While in the first phase our focus were kind of more on recycling, now we also wanted to include these novel circular business models, which aim for kind of material efficiency and, and also material life cycles and product life cycles. But also, of course, this recycling is, is still included here. So now we have a two year uh, public research project, it's co-innovation type project of Business Finland. So it means co-innovation between research organizations, companies, as well as other 
are the uh, organizations. This co-innovation part requires that we have company projects who applied funding also from Business Finland. So we now have four uh, uh, company projects and then we have this uh, public project part which is carried out by VTT and Turku and Lahti uh, Universities of Applied Sciences. And now you can see that the share of company involvement, company project is, is, is uh, three quarters of total budget. So total budget of all, all these research activities in the second phase combined is, is almost five million euros. And, and what is Lona Somiate who are working here, it's doing cooperation with the, with the other, other funding they have. But this is only kind of seven participants. We actually have 31 participants in Telaket U2 Business Finland projects. And how are the co other organizations that are not having their own uh, research or development project, they were able to participate by co-fund the public part. So Business Finland covers 60% of, of the uh, costs of, of public funding and then our research organizations have their kind of own funding share, but other uh, companies and other organizations were able to have partner role by co-funding this public part. We have uh, multiple companies in the first selection and other non-profit and other type of organizations also. So Finnish fashion, uh, uh, textile and fashion association, for example, is one of the, of the funding partners in this this work. So in this way, we are able to have a large group of different kind of organizations involved. Here is also the, the logos of the of the partners of this Telakaju do business Finland project site. And what we do in, in this public part, we have recycling here, but we have kind of more uh, uh, wider for, for topics around circular economy. And I shortly show what these work packages kind of mainly include. Uh, in most projects, they are management uh, um, work packets, but we included networking into it. So ne we have seen that we really have to network outside of Finland in order to, to have this kind of full value chains and understanding what is technology development and best practices in other countries. So we are networking widely nationally and internationally as well. And this coming here to talk through is of course one of these, these activities of the network. Then we have one work package focusing on business models. So we, in that work, we study what kind of business models there are, go develop business models together with the companies who are involved in, in our project. And also we kind of try to understand how, we, how these companies should communicate what they do within their value chain and to their customers as well. So understanding of, of this kind of communication activities in or as well. Then we have work packets which is, is for products and materials. And what that means is that we really take a review of, of this, how product designing phase affects the lifespan of the materials and products. So uh, this kind of designers guide for circular economy. We also study what kind of product information or material information to be included in the material can benefit in circular economy. It can provide transparency, but it can be also helping with the recycling part, product safety and many other issues, not just this kind of the transparency and traceability. And then we also kind of study bio-based material solutions for textiles. New fibers, new chem chemistries, how to replace this more harmful one with the bio-based solutions. In recycling part, in a public 
work, we still kind of develop concept for textile collecting and pre-sorting, study textile identification technologies and, and also sorting systems. And we have wanted to have some kind of draft of understanding of classification system for these recycled materials. We are looking sustainability, so environmental side, social side and also economics of, of the new, new solutions. Uh, there are so many different tools for how to evaluate uh, environmental impacts and social costs for of different kind of solutions. So we take a look of those and trying to get the understanding to our, our partner companies and organizations how to interpret this, this kind of information. And we made a model of, of costs of textile recycling in the first phase and we kind of uh, make um, little bit uh, further develop our model to make more accurate estimates of the, of the costs of different kind of collecting, sorting and recycling concepts. And of course, study market situation in the, in the end of the project. We continue demonstration. It's a nice visual way to show and communicate about the work. But since we have these business models, included in we also can make quick business model trials with with our companies test quickly new kind of ways to 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 uh, make business and consumers like in our our relooping fashion ecosystem model they are in the top consumers are one of the of the focus areas in in our work so we are making studies of consumer attitudes towards recycling and these new business models and we also direct our communication activities directly to common public in Finland. And then in ecosystem kind of and dissemination part, we try to, to see how we can support this ecosystem building. We check how we can scale up or export the potential results of, 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 of the work and of course check what are the first future development and research needs. How delicate has been success in, in taking Finland to our circularity and what are our success factors? We have strong in, involvement from companies, so we are aiming for business, not just making a project. We have been able to involve whole value chain, also charities, not just these companies and different type of organizations into our, our project. We are really focused on applied research, do demonstration, practical solutions which are close to market. We have had, in, fortunately, also long-term commitment funding agencies as well as our companies and research organizations. We do very uh, well cooperation and we all have a good trust between participants and, and communicate openly within our, our networks. And, and we have also very, very motivated individuals forming very innovative groups. So, this, so our group is more than just the sum of the individuals. And also where our project group have very optimistic view and, and see this transformation of textile sector, not just the kind of uh, something which needs to be done, but showing new opportunities, finding new, new business opportunities from that. And also we have uh, good connections with the different stakeholders, including ministries, other projects, other companies, education, and, and like I said, consumers. Our Telaket Yuhan website, you can find information there. And, and since I this was a short time and, and I have we have webinar presentation recorded about the Lucky You project and also other Finnish activities, which is available through this link. I can uh, put that on the chat box as well. And and we have these webinars continuation. They are open for anyone for you to, to sign in. And and we are planning to have five more within the coming year. I tried to be quick and I did, maybe I was able to kind of keep my time and I'm open to answer questions now or later on. Uh, Peter, okay, oh, one question quickly. Um, are, are there any recommendations that you could give to Estonia? How could we build such an ecosystem here locally? 
try to look at the success factor list. So involvement of funding agencies is of course important and trying to get all necessary kind of parts of value chain involved. Those are maybe the most important part. Have open communication, try to avoid uh, competition between participants. That's maybe the how we were able to have this kind of long term development activity going on. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully in the future we might also see a such ecosystem built in Estonia and maybe they could be also cooperation opportunities between uh, Finland and Estonia and the other Baltic countries too. I really hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, since I I also don't see any questions. I encourage listeners that you can actually post the questions in the chat box. And if we don't have currently time to uh, get them, I will try to answer forward you by email the answers later. But let's move on to uh, Sini Ilmonen, who will give um, tell her presentation about a practical example from Finland. Yes, hello. Thank you for the invitation for this event and thank you for great a uh, very great presentation today. It's uh, really easy to continue from here. I will try to also share my screen. Here we go. So uh, I'm going to present today uh, who we are and what is our role and and also uh, our plans to support the circularity of textiles. Uh, we are a municipal waste company located in Southwest Finland. Uh, we are working on our uh, active area is 17 municipalities and the biggest city and biggest city is Turku. And we have uh, collected post consumer textiles since 2016 and the Telaketu project also started. At the moment, our goal is to establish a nation, nationwide collection model. Uh, well, not even only collection, but the model for handling post consumer textiles and provide opportunities and support the development of the circularity of textiles also. Well, here is in Finland, but of course we are doing collaboration in, in neighbor countries. Um, already 2016, we find uh, in a municipal, mixed municipal waste that there, there is still textiles that could be sorted out. And we see, we saw then that there is a, there might be a possibilities on textiles. So we started to, with the local uh, university here, Turku University of Applied Sciences, we started to collect the textiles separately and, and find and look for opportunities to handle it and how we should sort it and what you are actually doing at the moment in Estonia. Uh, we are responsible on house, household waste and textile is one fraction on that. Um, our uh, actions are guided with loads of regulations, but also the waste hierarchy that first you should uh, prevent waste uh, waste creation and then you should re reuse them and then recycle them and, and the last one is to use it as an energy. In Finland we don't really landfill anymore any, any of the household wastes, just few percents. And as uh, David David already mentioned, uh, there is an EU requirement coming on 2025 that the textile should be collected separately. Uh, Finnish government has uh, has uh, well proposed that the collection should be started in Finland already 2023. We don't know if it's happening. Uh, or is it is it going to be in a, in a law? But that's that's a proposal at the moment. And we do uh, we see us as a 
as a good platform for circular economy because we are kind of a neutral neutral uh, actor in in the value chain and we, we are doing lots of national cooperation especially in Delagetu network we have been member of Delagetu since beginning and we do also international cooperation uh, our work well uh, as we heard today it the circularity of textile is much more than the uh, recycling it's also it's a design and reusing and, and many, many other things before we come to, to recycling. But when the textile is finally dischargeable, then we come in the picture. And our we have three development approaches that we see that we have to develop at, at the same time. One is this uh, separate collection system, then is a sorting and, and refinement, uh, refinement plant, and then of course the collaboration. Um, we see that this is a comprehensive solution. As we heard today already, that there's uh, many, many different sources of textiles. There is these uh, side streams of industry. There is uh, uh, leftovers from shops and from secondhand stores. And there's, for example, the workwear. But then there is this uh, post-consumer textiles from from consumers, and that. That, as we know, is uh, um, maybe most difficult because of there is no there is many mixed materials and also we don't know the origin uh, origin of the textiles. But that's that we are concentrating on in this solution. So we get the textiles from from consumers, we collect them, and and then we do the pre-sorting that the textiles some of the textiles is still going for reuse and totally waste and not uh, re, uh, recyclable they go into energy and then we are developing with the support of Delagetu network as well this optical material identification as a as a part of sorting facilities and then we have uh, invested in refiner refinement plant so this is the mechanical fiber opener and then we do collaboration with companies and there's uh, going on lots of research that what or for for which product the the open fibers could be used uh, in finland uh, we have around 30 different uh, municipal waste companies and the operational uh, area is covered is covering the whole finland um, we are collect we have been collecting a few years already but now we are trying to now we are negotiating with other municipal waste companies that they start the collection in their area and and they do the pre-sorting in their own own area uh, that's because we see that or we know already that the textiles is is ruined really easily it's getting mold if there's any any um, any uh, humid textiles or wet textiles in the containers. So we are now negotiating with all the municipal waste companies that they start the collection and do the pre-sorting in the area, and then they are going to send send the textiles to us for our our sorting and facilities. We are also doing uh, negotiating with uh, secondhand. Uh, stores and supermarkets and other clothing and fashion stores that they start they could uh, put our collection point in their facilities that we see that there's a many uh, benef beneficial things on that collection is that that the container the collection container will be inside and they're going to be easy for the consumers and they are they are going to be a uh, uh, easy, uh, well, uh, nearby the real textile streams. Uh, Harry mentioned the uh, EPR models. We see it's a little bit, um, might be a little bit problematic also because we are already building up the, the system 
And if the EPR comes, it might be that the responsibility of the textiles goes to producers. But of course, there are many different kind of models that we get the producers to support the, the system and not not making it any uh, any trouble on that. And that I actually already uh, already uh, talked about. So there is this uh, uh, model how we're going to uh, ask municipal waste companies to to handle the textiles locally and then send it to us. And we are we are trying to establish a national wide uh, model in in few years that we would be ready in 2023 that the government is proposed. Someone, someone's mic is open, so please could you close it down. And about the uh, scanner or the optical material identification, uh, as David mentioned, there there are uh, few few companies or few initiatives in in Europe that is trying to uh, find a ways to identify identify the materials, and also Red mentioned that the mono materials are most uh, easy to recycle, and we see that as well. And we have this uh, handheld scanner. It's uh, really small, and it's easy to easy to take part of the manual sorting. And on that way, we uh, can um, offer quality uh, quality sh uh, sorting for companies. It's based on uh, near and infrared uh, technology. And now we are in a phase that uh, we have few scanners bought and we have built the algorithm and the library. And we have few scanners to, to share the device for partners who would like to try, try it in their operations and collect openly the, or share in the network uh, the results and and see how the how the device works in in the operation. So if you are interested, please take contact. And after it's collected, sorted manually, and then uh, some of them is is also quality checked with the scanner. Then it's uh, the textiles is going to this mechanical. Uh, fiber opening line. So, uh, just uh, showing you the basic steps of the line. So there is this the sorting, and even this looks that it's done uh, uh, technically. It's it's made manually, and then it's cutting. There is the guillotine cutters that cuts the textiles in species. Then there's a uh, automated hard part removal, and then there is uh, then the uh, fibers is going to be threaded uh, uh, as a open fibers, and then it's ready for research or ready for uh, companies to use in their products. Um, so this opening line is just a one part of the whole recycling uh, chain. And if, if it's going to mechanical recycling or chemical recycling, normally or in many in many cases, the fiber has to be opened anyway. So that, that was a meaning, uh, missing piece in Finland and maybe in Estonia and Baltics as well. Uh, so we, we hope that we can offer and support the recycling uh, companies who are developing this recycling recycling uh, 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 products. So we are still looking for companies who could really make the products and use the fibers. So I'm really interested on the Baltics companies who are really 
uh, making products from recycled fibers and also uh, initiatives and and uh, and other projects that could could find the solutions. I think I'm a little bit over my time already, but a little bit about uh, the schedule. So the uh, first we have going to have a pilot lay, uh, opening line uh, end of end of this year, beginning of next year, and the capacity will be around 5,000 ton a year. And based on the results and experiences of the pilot lane, we are doing the invest investment plans for bigger, bigger factory. And of course, then we need more volume of the textiles. So maybe in the future, we can be a result for the for the Estonia as well, where you could send the textiles for opening. Of course, we have to find the recycle the product where to use the open and fibers as well. But at least this is the one link. And if you find yourself in this picture, please please take contact and uh, con let's continue the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Sini, again for a very uh, interesting presentation. You have a very interesting project going on, and as Sini mentioned, they so you are looking, uh, so you're producing a fiber, and you're looking for companies, organization, initiatives who could use that fiber, correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. We have a uh, different. Uh, different organizations, also companies listening today. So uh, keep in mind that you can uh, contact Sini if you are interested in the fiber products. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so we are actually quite well on time. Uh, this now concludes our first parts of the day. Uh, thank you again to all the presenters, to Red, Harry, David, Pirio and Sini. Uh, still, if you have some questions, please uh, let us know and we can uh, try to get them back to them by email. And uh, now we're going to have a break until uh, 12.30 when we will continue with the second part of the day. We will hear some presentations about different uh, initiatives, um, companies and best practice examples from Estonia. And the second part is going to be in Estonian language. So thank you again for now and uh, see you back in around 70 minutes. <laughs>